All right. Well, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Before we begin our webinar tonight, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Global Math Department. The Global Math Department is an organization that is run entirely by volunteers. To keep the free high quality PD, we need webinar speakers, webinar hosts, and writers for our weekly newsletter. Newsletter writers share about an area of math or math teaching that resonates with them or discusses recent math blogs that help teachers reflect on their practice. If you'd like to volunteer or know someone who would be great in any of these areas, uh, please have them email us at globalmathdepartment at gmail.com. I'll put that email address in the sticky note here in a little bit. Or you can have them reach out to us on Twitter. Um, the meetings are recorded. So the, the tonight's meeting is recorded and you will get a link to that within about 24 hours after the meeting ends. The Global Math Community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. The chat room is available for topical and general conversation throughout the meeting. And I'll be sure to catch your questions for our presenters um, if they don't see them themselves. Uh, I know several of you have already introduced yourselves in the chat, so feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat if you haven't already done so, letting us know what you teach and where you are teaching at this moment. Well, hopefully you're not teaching at this moment. <laughs> hopefully hopefully uh, you're not trying to teach while well, watch the webinar. That'd be quite a feat. Um, tonight we have three speakers with us, uh, Lindsay Gallus, Sarah Stecker and Luke Wilcox, and they're going to be talking to us on what is experience first, formalize later. Um, Lindsay, Sarah, and Luke uh, met each other at East Kentwood High School. Uh, Luke still teaches at East Kentwood High School, um, and he uh, believes that students and teachers learn best when there is a context to connect uh, to their learning. Um, Lindsay has experience teaching math in both middle school and the high school setting. She creates context in the classroom that activates students' curiosity and fosters student discovery by encouraging students to share their observations in small group discussions. And Sarah uh, has experienced teaching a variety of high school math courses as well, ranging from geometry to AP calculus. Her mission is to make challenging mathematics content accessible and engaging for students through discovery and collaboration. Um, and they are all uh, from Michigan. Um, that's where they uh, met each other at East, East Kentwood High School. So I am now gonna turn the presentation over to uh, one of the three of them. I'm not sure who's starting, but one of them will start. <laughs> Yes, that is me. Thank you, Lee. Uh, it is so great to see everybody tonight or kind of see, I guess I see your, your text in the chat, uh, which is excellent. I must say, uh, I enjoyed seeing the locations of all of you with this being like a global math department. I was very curious about time zones uh, because I will admit, I think this is the latest presentation I've ever done. So I had my afternoon, well, my evening cup of coffee to prepare for this. So Luke and Sarah, how are you both doing tonight? Good. I definitely had an extra coffee as well today, uh, but I'm, I'm ready to go. Yes, I am doing well also. I'm excited to uh, jump into this presentation with you all. Awesome. Um, all right. So we're going to get going because this is also in addition to the latest, one of the shortest uh, PDs we've done in a while. We tend to go on and on a little bit. So this is going to be great for us. It's really forced us to, to um, boil down what it is that we do and to get some of our most important ideas out there and uh, to try to share it as succinctly as possible. So we're really excited. Um, all right, so let's get going. Um, the title of our session today is what is experience first formalized later, or in other words, EFL. Um, we got sick of saying experience first formalized later and we shortened it to EFL. And so when we're talking about EFL, we're talking about this model that we use um, to write all of our lessons. So our learning targets for today are first First of all, just describe the four parts of an experience first formalized later lesson. Uh, understand those features of an EFL lesson and what the purpose of each of those features is. And then also um, to explore what impact these EFL lessons have on a student's experience in the mathematics classroom. So uh, we're going to start out with actually a little bit of a story. Uh, and this story comes from Luke. And it's not about math, is it, Luke? It's, it's not, but I promise I'll tie it in to, uh, to the mathematics. Um, so this is a, a story about uh, wrenching on cars, which I do a whole lot of now. 
uh, but I didn't when I was younger. And so I'm going to go back to a much younger version of me. It was the second year of college for me. I had my uh, first car, 1988 Ford Escort GT, and uh, started hearing some noises in the front end when I was hitting the brakes. So obviously, you know, I, I knew I needed some new brakes. So I brought it to the shop just to get an estimate to see what it would cost. And I think they quoted me at something like six or seven hundred dollars to replace the brakes. And being a college student, uh, fairly broke at the time, I just that like was not in the budget. And I knew that you could buy the parts for, you know, around a hundred dollars. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I can do this myself and I can I can save myself some money. And I, I did have some uh, a very, very minimal uh, previous experience working on cars. You know, I I had gotten a flat tire before in my escort and I had changed the uh, the front wheel. Uh, so that was like some previous experience. Um, I also had had worked on mountain bikes a little bit and, you know, I had replaced the brake pads on my mountain bike at some point. And so that gave me enough confidence to say, I'm going to take on this project myself. And so I brought it over to my father-in-law's. He had some tools and a jack and some things that I could use to at least get started. And so, you know, I get the front of the car jacked up. I get it on jack stands. I get the wheel off that I had all done before, you know, in, in previous experiences, I take the wheel off and here is what I am staring at. And uh, and this is sort of where uh, my now my previous knowledge ends and my new experience starts, because I really don't know anything about car brakes at this time. And so I'm staring at this like big circular metal uh, disc and it has this big like clamp on it, this big metal clamp on it. And I just start sort of poking around and like looking at the bolts and thinking about like where I would have to remove the bolts. Um, I noticed that there's a little rubber hose that comes off of this big clamp and I follow the hose all the way back up into the engine bay and realize that that's where the brake fluid goes. And so there must be some sort of brake fluid that is using some sort of hydraulic pressure to, to clamp down on this, on this metal disc. And so I'm starting to like form some ideas about how, you know, car braking systems work. And so eventually I figured out the, the two bolts that I needed to remove this clamp. And I knew I had to get that big metal disc off. And so I'm shaking it. It's not moving. I'm hitting it with a hammer. I'm hitting it real hard with a hammer. And it just does not seem to be budging. And so I run into my first sort of uh, sticking point. And uh, I decide that I, I don't really know what I'm doing. And I'm going to call my Uncle Pete because I know he's a good mechanic. And so I call him up. I tell him what I'm doing, sort of explain the scenario. And uh, he starts giving me some more uh, language to work with. He says this big metal disc that I'm hitting with a hammer is called a rotor. And this big clamp that's holding onto the rotor is called a caliper. And inside the caliper is where you find the brake pads, which I had heard before. And so the issue is that this rotor will not come off. And he says, well, a lot of times there's a little, uh, two little set screws and if you look at this picture closely, you can see there's two little set screws that actually hold the rotor in place, which somehow I had not seen. And so uh, I was able to remove those set screws and then I didn't even really need a hammer. It just came right off, you know, like it was supposed to. And so I, you know, I got the, the rotor off um, and got the new rotor on and I'm um, trying to put this uh, caliper back on with the brake pads, the new brake pads. And uh, it, it won't go on. It just doesn't seem to fit. Like there's not enough room. And so I, you know, I, I, I call my Uncle Pete again and uh, explain the scenario. And he says, oh, well, that caliper has a little piston inside of it. And that piston needs to be pushed back in before you can fit the brake pads in with enough room to get them back over the rotor. And you're probably going to need a new tool for that. You're going to need a C-clamp that will help you to retract the piston. And so I said, all right, well, I'm going to the parts store. I, there's, a new, there's a new tool that I need, which is a C-clamp. And he said, well, good. The other thing you should pick up when you're at the parts store is what's called a Chilton's manual. And uh, anybody who's, who's worked on cars may know that a Chilton's manual uh, has detailed diagrams and explanations and uh, sort of steps that you can do for certain projects for cars. And so sure enough, I went to the parts store. I was able to find a C-clamp. I was able to buy this Chilton's manual, came back to the project. Uh, the C-clamp worked perfectly. It was able to retract the piston and the caliper, was able to get the new pads in, um, even followed along. There were some nice diagrams in the Chilton's manual, which like sort of showed what I was doing. And I was able to successfully put the new brakes on, put the wheel back on, put the escort back down on the road, and it worked. 
uh, the, the brakes worked. I did it, took it for a test run and uh, the brakes worked beautifully. And I had saved myself, I don't know, five or six hundred dollars from that. Um, now, later on in life, over the course of the next 20 years, uh, I ran into a lot more um, brake jobs. I've probably done 10 of them since then on a variety of different vehicles, you know, uh, SUVs, sports cars, different, you know, Hondas, Subarus. And of course, everyone that I encountered was slightly different. You know, the brake setup was a little bit different. But using the sort of fundamentals that I learned through this first brake job, uh, I've been able to successfully complete many, many brake jobs since then, even, even you know, just uh, a couple of weeks ago doing those on a, on a Honda Pilot. And so when you sort of look at this experience as a whole, this learning experience that I went through uh, with this Ford Escort, um, it's, it's kind of awesome how uh, the learning was sort of a natural thing that occurred. Um, I was able to use some of my prior knowledge. I was able to collaborate with my Uncle Pete uh, to help sort of move my knowledge forward. Uh, I had to gather some new tools. And uh, in doing so, not only did I learn how to do the brakes for a 1988 Ford Escort GT, but I really learned about braking systems, uh, automotive braking systems, which allowed me to be much more flexible in my, in my skills in, in working on cars. And uh, I just kind of think that this is like an amazing way to learn things, which is maybe different than, you know, nowadays, a lot of people will pull up a YouTube video. It'll show them the nine steps that they need in order to complete the brake job. They'll follow the nine steps precisely. And sure, they got that brake job done, but they might not really understand uh, braking systems. And so if this way of learning has been so successful for me in my automotive experience, uh, why couldn't we create that same sort of experience in the math classroom? And, uh, you know, I, I started thinking about this, I don't know, seven or eight years ago and started collaborating with Lindsay and with Sarah and, uh, you know, we decided that we wanted to try and create some sort of similar experience to this in the math classroom, something where students were able to try things out, get stuck, collaborate with others, develop new tools uh, with the goal that at the end of it, they have uh, not just a knowledge of how to do a certain specific problem, but that they have some uh, fundamental understanding of, of how the mathematics works allowing them to be much more flexible in their thinking if they were to encounter, you know, other mathematical problems that were maybe similar, but slightly different. And so uh, I think six or seven years ago, maybe is when we, 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 we did our first crack at trying to teach one of these style lessons. And it certainly took us several, several years to refine this model that we, uh, that we now call experience first formalized later. And I will say now, you know, six or seven years later, uh, we do have this uh, down to a bit of a, a, a template. You know, we've really, we've really honed in on the uh, most important parts of what make one of these FL lessons a successful lesson. And so in any of the FL lessons that we've designed that you'll see, uh, we're, we're going to follow these same four steps. Okay, you'll see this in all of the lessons. Um, the first part, and probably the most important part, this is the experience for students, is the activity. And in a typical math classroom, this would be about a 20 minute activity where students are working in groups of four uh, through a sequence of questions in some sort of a context. And this is done without any teacher instruction at the front of the hour. So the students start out in their groups of four, they spend about 20 minutes working on this experience, which we call the activity. Now, of course, the teacher is walking around and monitoring and interacting with students, but the students are doing the heavy lifting when it comes to the activity. And then we get to the second part of an FL lesson, uh, which is the debrief. And that is where the teacher is then going to lead a full class discussion where uh, the teacher is going to ask students to explain some of their thinking, explain the approaches maybe that they used. Uh, and in that debrief, the teacher is going to get more formal in the learning. So this is where like new vocabulary, this is where formulas might be layered on to the learning that students have already uh, uh, done. And so this is like when, you know, I'm, I was learning about the caliper and the rotor and the language that was associated with uh, the, the breaks. Uh, after the debrief uh, is step number three, the quick notes. This is the more traditional part of a math lesson where uh, the teacher is providing direct instruction 
of sort of the uh, major learning points. And these are uh, always going to be tied back to the learning targets from the beginning of the lesson. Now, we limit ourselves in space. There's only a small box that fits the quick notes. And we also sort of limit ourselves on time to about five minutes where the direct instruction happens, where we're capturing the uh, most important ideas that are related to the learning targets from the beginning of the lesson. And then finally, the last step of an FL lesson is step four, the check your understanding. Uh, this is where students are going to be presented with some new scenarios uh, that's going to ask them to apply their learning in a new context or in a slightly different way. This is, this is where they're getting their practice with the, with the new learning that they have. Uh, and so the check your understanding, depending on how much time we have at the end of the lesson, is about 15 minutes. So you're going to see all four of these components in any of the EFL lessons uh, that, that we have created. Uh, but we'd really like to take you into the specifics of one math lesson so that you can see exactly what these four components look like. So Sarah is going to take you through this lesson, uh, the Panera lesson. And uh, I think Sarah is, is, is ready to enter into uh, uh, teacher mode here. So she is going to be explaining this lesson from the perspective of the teacher in the classroom and really give you some insight into what her classroom would look like for this specific lesson. So Sarah, I mean, Ms. Stecker, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Um, so I want to take you into my classroom with me today, um, which I know we don't always get the chance to do that. So this is very fun. Um, so we are um, talking about system today, but that's not something that I'm telling the students up front. All I'm telling them is today we're going to talk about Panera, which is a place that they have all been. And we're going to answer this question of does Panera charge fairly? And so the only thing I'm going to say at the beginning of class is, hey, would somebody be willing to read what's in this box? It sounds like we have Pate and Kelly and Carter. Um, they are colleagues. They're working together. And apparently they take turns uh, bringing food for their department. How nice of them from Panera. And then at that point, I would set them off to work in their groups, and they are in groups of three or four. Um, and I would make sure that one of the group members was assigned to be the reader. And this just makes sure that they have somebody that starts talking right away and that there's not a lot of lag time as there, so they're not just sitting there idly. Um, and so at that point, the students are working on the front page of this activity, and we're actually going to go through a few of the questions that they would answer in their groups. Um, and so it starts here. They are given uh, an order. This is Peyton's order. And they can see that Peyton has ordered eight bagels and two cream cheeses. Um, and she pays $19.50. So in their groups, they're thinking about, okay, what is a possible cost for a single bagel? And what is a possible cost for a tub of cream cheese? So as students are discussing this, I'm going to be walking around and I'm going to be listening in on those conversations. And so I kind of do that for two reasons. So one of the reasons I do that is because I want to understand how students are thinking about this. Um, and I know that all of the intuition and the logic and the background knowledge that they're bringing into this lesson is going to be something that I can leverage in that debrief section later. I want to learn what students are thinking, and I also want to start thinking about that debrief about what student I might want to share. Um, as I am walking around, I am asking them some questions. So, for example, I might say something like, okay, how did you know that this was a possible cost? And why, why does it even say this word possible? Um, how can you know for sure? Do we know for sure uh, what this bagel costs or what this tub of cream cheese costs? Um, and I'm going to be listening in on those answers. And so then students get into the next couple of questions. So now they found this possible cost. Um, I've made some notes on my clipboard about um, kinds of the strategies that students were using as they came up with these possible costs. And here in question two, now all of a sudden they are given a second order. So Kelly also went to Panera. Um, she got 12 bagels and three tubs of plain cream cheese. Um, and so now it's asking students to think about, okay, if Panera charges fairly, whatever that means, 
much Kelly's order cost. Um, and so I am walking around and I'm hearing some students think about, okay, how does Kelly's order compare to Peyton's order? Um, and I'm starting to hear some groups talk about, okay, that it's, um, it's like one and a half times as big. So we went from eight bagels to 12 bagels. We went from two tubs of cream cheese to three tubs of cream cheese. Um, and so I would press in a little bit and be, um, and ask them, well, like, how would we then know what it costs? You're saying something about 1.5. How do we use that to determine how much Kelly's order would cost? Um, and that kind of leads into that next question of, okay, it says, if they're charging fairly. Well, like, what does that mean? What would it mean if a Panera charges fairly? Um, and students would may say something like, um, well, it means that every customer is paying the same price. I'm like, okay, so unfairly would be if Kelly had to pay $2 for a bagel, but Peyton had to pay $1.50 for a bagel. Okay, so that doesn't make much sense. And would also make this problem very, very hard to solve, right? If everybody kind of just had a different price, then we wouldn't really be able to find any kind of solution here to this um, problem that we have of not knowing how much this bagel and this cream cheese costs. Um, and then finally, they're talking about, okay, if Panera does charge fairly, if in fact every customer gets the same price for a bagel and the same price for a tub of plain cream cheese, um, how could you find the cost of a single bagel and a single tub of plain cream cheese? Now, me as a teacher, I know that this question three is really important for students' as learning because the learning target for this lesson is we want students to really understand what is an independent system, what is a dependent system, a consistent system, and an inconsistent system. So I, as a teacher, know that that question three is going to be really important for this, right? This Or explain why this is not possible. Um, so students may have done some systems in the past, they may not have. And so at this point, I'm hearing a lot of discussion of, okay, we have two orders. That seems good, right? We have two subtotals. Can we figure out this cost of a single bagel and a single tub of cream cheese? So again, I'm listening in here. Um, there's going to be times where if I hear an answer that I know is going to be very helpful for the rest of the class, I'm gonna make a note on my clipboard um, and I'm gonna ask that student to write up their answer on the board. So sometimes I will ask very specific students to do that. Sometimes I will just put a marker on their desk and say, hey, put up one of the answers on the board you may choose who in your group is going to do that. So I vary that from day to day, um, and I also vary that based on the answers that students said. So that's kind of the first part where students are working in their groups, they're talking to each other, I'm listening, I'm asking questions to learn what they're thinking, and also to push their thinking um, to that more advanced level. And so that's what we consider the activity part of the lesson. And once those 20 minutes are up and students have worked through that front page in their groups, um, they may not have every single answer, but they at least have some thoughts uh, jotted down um, and they're ready for that whole class debrief. So at this point now, there are answers written up on the board. So various students have done this. Uh, usually one group will write up one of the answers. And so we have a variety of handwritings up on the board. And so at this point, this is where we can really showcase different students' thinking and strategies. So for example, for that first one, um, I'm gonna have multiple groups share. So I might ask Shamira, what did your group do? How did you decide that the bagel was going to be $1? And I'd open it up to the class and I'd say, okay, did other groups get that same thing? Did you also say the bagel would be $1? How did you come up with that decision? How did you make those um, how did you make those decisions? And so I would have different students share there. Um, and so let's say then we were on question two and I might say, Lindsay, um, you know, you talked a little bit here about this Kelly and her, her order. Can you talk to us a little bit about what do you mean here? How were you able to figure out what Kelly's order would cost? Well, I noticed right away that we went from eight to 12 bagels. So I was already thinking about like, four, eight, 12, that, you know, like there's like that common factor in there. And so I was thinking about, okay, well, I got four more bagels or in other words, like half of the amount of bagels I started with. But then I also noticed with the cream cheese that I had two cream cheeses and now I have three and half of two is one. So that kind of helped me think about really that I've got one and a half the size. I was thinking maybe they sell like 
four bagels with one cream cheese. And so for Peyton, she got like two sets of that. And then for Kelly, she got like three sets of that. So I just started thinking about it that way. And I figured out that she got, Kelly got one and a half times the amount. So I assumed that she should pay one and a half times as much. Okay. So Lindsay's saying something here about how both the quantities were one and a half times as much. And so that made her say that then the subtotal or the amount that she's paying is also one and a half times as much. And so what I'd like everybody to do right now is I'd like you to get out your red pen. Um, so you have all of your answers written in pencil in the middle of the page. We are now going to add some notes in the margin because what Lindsay just said about this, her order being one and a half times as much and then her subtotal being one and a half times as much, that was a really, really important idea that we're going to keep talking about. And so this phenomenon, when you're simply scaling the order, right, everything is one and a half times as much, we call that an equivalent equation. So notice the order, the eight bagels and the two tubs of cream cheese were multiplied by one and a half. And then so was the other side of the equation. Well, that makes sense. So now the um, if eight bagels and two cream cheeses cost $19.50, well, now also that amount has to get multiplied by one and a half. And so we have these two equivalent equations. Okay, um, I also saw some groups having this discussion about charging fairly. Um, and one of the things I heard is that the price had to be the same for every customer. And so meaning that there is actually a price that we can solve for here. There is a price, a uniform price for a bagel and a uniform price for a um, tub of cream cheese. They're not just willy nilly deciding on these things, right? These values aren't changing. And in math, when we the variables have a set value, we say that the system is consistent. So in the margins, I'd like you to, with your red pen, um, go ahead and write that we call this a consistent system. That is a one of the vocabulary words um, that we have today. And for question three, I noticed some groups were saying that there really isn't a, enough information. Um, so, Lindsay, can you tell us why, even though we have Kelly's order and Peyton's order, why do we still not have enough information to decide what the cost of a bagel and a tub of cream cheese is? Well, we were looking back uh, even like in the first problem when we were sort of guessing like, oh, maybe a bagel's only a dollar, maybe bagel's a two dollars. We still couldn't quite figure out like the price of cream cheese because it depended on that. So with this one, we're also thinking about like, well, now we have four more bagels, which is great, but we still can't figure out the price of a bagel because we also got more cream cheese. So unless we knew one of them, either the bagel or the cream cheese, we couldn't figure out the rest because it, it was just sort of like, like you were saying, like if we doubled the order, we'd pay twice the amount total, but I don't know anything about like the individual pieces. Yeah. So you're saying that the, this Kelly's equation, right? We could write an equation for Kelly's order. It's really just a scaled up version. It's not providing us additional information. It makes sense just intuitively that the cost is going to be one and a half times as much, but it doesn't help us pinpoint what each of the individual items costs because Kelly's order is very much dependent on what Peyton ordered because it's just one and a half times as much. And so in the margins here, because these two equations are equivalent, um, this is a dependent system. So the second equation, because it's equivalent to the first, it doesn't give us any more information. And all of those possible combinations, remember how we had all those different groups share the possible combinations? All of those combinations work for Kelly's order as well. Because when we talk about equivalent, those things, we say that those things are balanced. So they're giving us the same information, even though they look like different equations and they represent different orders, it's actually an equivalent equation. And so it doesn't quite yet help us narrow down what a single tub of cream cheese costs or a single bagel. And so this system that's made up of these two equivalent equation, it has infinitely many solutions. There's a whole load of possible combinations that we could use for a price of a bagel and a price of tub of um, price for a tub of cream cheese that we could use here. Okay, 
So the debrief would kind of continue on in that way. There's a couple more questions on this lesson. If you were to see the full lesson, um, they get Carter's order, um, and then they are actually able to use some elimination there. Um, but we just wanted to give you a little uh, preview of what that kind of sounds like, what it looks like in a classroom, um, and what that would be like. And so the next part of the lesson then is what Luke was talking about with these quick notes. Now, this can be done with the students. Um, generally, I ask them to uh, do, do a little think, pair, share, like, okay, what, what did we learn here? What are some of the new vocabulary that we have? What are some of the uh, big ideas that we want to take away from this lesson? Um, and so we have that limited space there and about five minutes of time where we're just going to capture some of those things from the debrief. So really important things were just said, right? Lindsay shared some important ideas. Shamira shared some important ideas earlier. How can we make sure that tomorrow or a week from now, that we still remember those things, right? So um, think about these as notes to our future forgetful self. So we talked about these words, independent and dependent. We talked about inconsistent. We might here make some connections to what the graphs of those linear equations look like. And we also talked about elimination and what that has to do with scaling and how that then helps us um, to compare the equations um, and make it so that all of the difference is attributed to only one variable and why we might subtract orders and what that represents. And after we do the quick notes, again, that's only about five minutes. Now we're going to let students work in their groups again. Um, some days they might work individually. Usually they're back with their groups and working on a few check your understanding questions. And just like the name implies, um, this is really for them. It is not graded, but it is for them to see, okay, can I apply this to a new context? Can I apply it with different numbers? Can I use the same context um, but apply it in a different way. Maybe now it's in an abstract problem. Now we're no longer talking about bagels and cream cheese. Can I still make sense of this idea of an independent system, a dependent system? Um, and what am I, what is it going to take for me to fully kind of solidify that understanding? So this is just the next stage in that learning process. And this kind of takes us to um, pretty much the end of the hour. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, so much for that. So um, just to sort of recap what you just saw and to summarize what Luke had brought up earlier is those are the four parts of an EFA lesson. So we always start out with an activity uh, and that activity starts with students uh, working together in groups prior to any uh, instructor feedback or instruct like input. Um, from us as the teacher. And then as they're working and finishing that up, we are always monitoring, facilitating, um, and kind of keeping tabs on everybody and making sure these discussions are headed in the way we need them to go. Uh, and then from there, we do our debrief. That is our second part where we are summarizing, but also formalizing what they've talked about in their groups. Then we're getting into the quick notes, which is where we're um, putting some of those formal definitions, vocabulary, summarizing, and then students get some time in groups to do some practice and to have a chance to apply what they just learned in the check your understanding problems and also to self-assess. Um, so that is a quick overview of what an EFL lesson looks like. Uh, what we're wondering then, or well, wondering and noticing, um, we want to know what do you notice about the design of this lesson? So what things uh, stuck out? to you? And then also, what do you wonder about with the design of this lesson? What questions do you have? Um, you know, how do you, what, what else do you want to know from us? So um, what we've done is we did, um, Sarah just put in the chat a Padlet link. So if you could please click that Padlet link. Um, and we are going to give you two minutes to put on the Padlet. What do you notice and what do you wonder about the design of this lesson? So if you could please click that and then uh, fill in what you notice, what you wonder. We'll keep an eye on it as well. Uh, we'll awkwardly stare at you until the two minutes are up. Um, and then we'll talk through some of the things that we see on the Padlet. So go ahead and take a moment to jot down some uh, noticings and wonderings, and I will let you know when your two minutes are up.
All right. So those were our two minutes. Um, seeing lots of really great things on uh, our Padlet here. One thing, and it's, I mean, I promise I wasn't just going for the first one I saw and I did read all of them. Um, but this idea on our very first one about this being a structure and not a script. And that is a really important idea. What we try to do with these lessons with an Apple lesson is we use them to create structure for both ourselves and for our students, because that also gives us some accountability. So, uh, you know, we're, we're sure we're hitting our learning targets. We're sure that we are teaching students what they need to know. Um, and it provides us just an opportunity to have consistency as well. Uh, prior to this, teaching this way, I often use like an inquiry-based activity or discovery-based activity a couple times a unit. And then the other days were more direct instruction. And it's like, those were note-taking days and then these were activity days. And what we've been able to do with an Apple lesson is to sort of marry the two. Um, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit and adding another thing I noticed is someone asked like, how often do you do this? We do this every single day. These are every lesson we teach is in this format because the structure allows us to do both. It allows us to always start with something discovery-based, but we are still able to formalize. We're able to add on definitions, vocabulary, uh, formulas, and then also practice. Having the check your understanding problems built in every day is really helpful to us compared to what I think a lot of discovery-based uh, instruction it tends to be, it's sort of like in a silo, like you have your activity day and then your lesson day. And so um, by creating this structure, we've been able to do sort of like mini activities every day that also give us a chance to do some direct instruction and then also some uh, practice problems or give students an opportunity to show what they know. Uh, Luke, what did you notice or wonder about the notice and wonders? Well, uh, the one that sticks out to me in the noticing here is about less teacher talking. And I know for myself personally, I'm in my 21st year teaching. And in my first 10 years teaching, I sure did a whole lot of talking. And I thought I was pretty good at it. But uh, uh, since then, transitioning into this model where students are leading the learning and students are doing more of the talking, I can tell you it has been just so much more fun as a teacher uh, just like looking forward to the day and the lessons because uh, students are, are leading that. And there's like a little bit of like sort of pressure taken off of you as the teacher because you're empowering the students to be uh, leading the learning. And so uh, definitely true about less teacher talking. And I can say based on my own personal experience that I really have enjoyed that shift in my own teaching. Uh, Sarah, what did, what did you notice? You know, there was quite a few comments talking about how these concepts of like dependent, uh, independent systems were related to a real world context. Um, and I think that's something that we try to do, not just to make it so that we have a hook to the lesson or that it's, you know, real world and thus applicable to students. But we notice that when we use contexts that are familiar to our students, um, they're able to use a lot of intuition um, and logic to reason their way through the problems. Um, and so it gives a lot of students an access points into ideas that can sometimes be very, very abstract. Um, so this idea of an in, a deep or a dependent system, you know, with infinitely many solutions, like what does that mean? Um, and instead, by talking about, okay, consistent really just means that they're charging fairly, there is a price, there is a value of X and a value of Y. Um, and what is actually, what does this idea of dependence mean? Well, it makes sense when I'm talking about Kelly's order and how I actually can't narrow down the cost of a bagel or tub of cream cheese. Um, and so in when we layer in then uh, that vocabulary later, the idea is already um, in students' minds, so now it's just connecting it to the more um, formal learning targets of the day, um, but it's not teaching everything from scratch because they already have um, that intuition. Um, so if we could go who uh, share. Oh, you're muted, Lindsay. Am I good now? Yes. Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, so what we wanted to talk through about a lot of these things that we've already touched on are just some of the design principles that we think about when we're creating these lessons. So uh, first and foremost, as Sarah was just talking about, we try to think about what is 
the context we're going to use for the experience portion or for the activity portion. Um, and really our goal with that is we're just trying to build on what students already know because that's going to help them have more uh, intuitive thinking and to be able to reason through these problems without having to rely on you know, like M equals Y2 minus Y1 and stuff like that. Instead, we're just trying to think about how much does a bagel cost? Students have a relevant experience with that. So first, we're always trying to think of a context that we can use um, that is meaningful and that highlights the math isn't just some sort of like arbitrary add-on. Uh, next, we're always trying to use inviting and informal language. We are trying with these activities to create an access point for every single student. We want to have um, every student feel like they can participate and engage, and we're not trying to be the gatekeepers to mathematical knowledge. We're trying to invite students into the thinking and to the discovery. Uh, the next part is we are trying to focus on opportunities for mathematical reasoning. We're not just trying to get students to be able to come up with a procedure that then is sort of like a rinse and repeat, do this every single time you see a problem like this. Instead, we're really focusing on problem solving, on flexible thinking. We're not trying to do like a rote memorization. Uh, we're not doing the same type of problem over and over and over again. We want students instead to be problem solving. Um, and then that leads us into this next part about building in complexity or gradually building. So as I mentioned before, we want students to always have an access point. That's why we use informal language. That's why we try to use a relevant context is because we want all students to be able to enter in to the math. And then what we do is we sort of slowly turn up the math dial on them. And so our lessons uh, always have really intentional scaffolding in the questions. We try to build from one question to the next to the next and um, try to even preview in question number two, maybe what's coming in question number five. And so we're trying to just uh, gradually build that up so that students are able to complete entire activities without teacher input. That is always our goal, is that students can do this without having to um, get information from the teacher. And then the last part is about learning through collaboration. So our students are always in groups of four. They're always working together on these activities. Um, and we spend a lot of time at the beginning of the year focusing just on good group work, group work norm. Sarah mentioned in her um, example earlier on, you know, like there's a person who's a reader. That's so that there's no lag time so that nobody's just kind of sitting there staring or you know everybody's got their head down and working by themselves. So we do spend a lot of time focusing on collaboration uh, and talking with students about the value of learning from each other. And that's been really successful with us uh, with these activities and for students also. They, Luke mentioned, you know, like as a teacher, it's so much more fun to teach this way. As a learner, it's so much more fun to learn this way. And, you know, I've had plenty of students who, you know, they say they don't really like math, but they like math class uh, because they get to participate, they're engaged, they're not bored. Um, and it's not because it's like, oh, it's the fun class. And it, no, it's because they're actively engaged and because they're able to participate and bring something to the table. So that's a really important part of these lessons. Uh, so much of the success, I think, comes from classroom norms and um, the community that these lessons have really helped us to foster. Yeah, so uh, we're going to do a little bit of a shift here. We've been uh, spending a lot of time here talking specifically about the design of the lessons and how they're designed. But now we want to think more about some of the potential outcomes of using lessons like this. And in order to do that, we want to think about uh, the student perspective here. And so put yourself in the shoes of your students and think about how this uh, math classroom experience might be a little bit different. And the question that we have that we pose to you for you to just quickly reply in the chat here is uh, what messages are we sending? When, if, if we use this EPPL approach in our math classrooms, uh, if you're a student sitting in that classroom, what are the messages that you are hearing uh, from, from your teacher? What are the, the messages that you're hearing by going through uh, a lesson? Is this 
specialized later approach. Feel free to drop your uh, thoughts in the chat there, but thinking the student perspective messages are we sending students by using this Apple approach? All right, so we are going to try and use some of these responses that we're seeing in the chat here to help uh, answer this this next question here, which is thinking about some of the outcomes of what what happens in a classroom when you when you do this. You know, if you use these ethel lessons on a consistent basis, uh, what are some of the potential outcomes here? And Lindsay, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so a couple of different ones I'm noticing in the chat are about this idea of participation that you know, a student feels like they are encouraged to participate, but also they're expected to participate. But then even more than that, some people mention about like they're um, becoming more active in their own math learning. And so for me, that just really um, talks about the impact of EFL is that it empowers learners. Uh, it puts students at the focus and at the center and really allows them to take the learning on as their own. And I was thinking about whenever I um, do a workshop with teachers, we always are concerned about, you know, when you first start an EFL lesson and how it's going to go, because, you know, we'll be honest, sometimes at the beginning of the year, it can be a little painful. Uh, it can be a little quiet, first of all. Like it's just students sort of sitting there and sort of awkward and don't really know how to participate in groups. But by the end of the year, by spring, it's incredible. Like I truly can just like hand out an activity to students and I could just sit there for 45 minutes and watch them do the entire thing and come up with it on their own. And it does take time and it takes some training, but it's really incredible to watch them individually, but then also as a community in their classroom to take on ownership of their learning. And I think so much of that is them just realizing that they can do this and that they are an active participant in their own learning and they're not just waiting to hear, you know, what I have to say and then copying what I do. So, yeah. They, oh, sorry. Go ahead. That, that gets into uh, this, this next idea, um, which I, I noticed a couple of comments that I think connect to this. Um, I see Eleanor had said that, you know, there's not a magic answer that the teacher is looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we're trying to do is to redefine uh, what it, what mathematics is. It is not about answer getting. It is not about mimicking the process that the teacher has already shown you. Uh, it's about problem solving and sense making. And so, you know, that's part of what these ethical lessons can do is sort of redefine for students what, uh, what, what doing math is all about. Um, I also saw a comment from Stacy. You know, we can all have different ideas, ways, and notations to explore a problem. And so it's really that exploring the problem that is the mathematics. You know, the process of thinking and reasoning and discussing and collaborating, that's what we want students to think mathematics is, not just this final answer that we get and this set of steps that are needed in order to arrive at that final answer. Yeah, and one of the other points that we want to talk about um, is how this makes for some more equitable learning opportunities for our students. Um, and so oftentimes a mathematics classroom can be a very exclusive space. Um, and there's a lot of social dynamics going on. Um, we can think about whose ideas get taken up, whose ideas get ignored, um, who is considered expert. Um, and so there's lots of questions about 
you know, who has the authority in the class, who has the power in the class. Um, and one of the things that we try to do with these ethical lessons is we try to delegate some of that authority. And we kind of do that in two different ways. Um, Luke and Lindsay have already talked a little bit, and there's comments in the chat as well about you know, that authority that generally just the teacher has alone as like the sole source of knowledge, they're really delegating that to students by saying, okay, you guys are going to be the ones that are coming up with the answer. I'm not going to start by pre-teaching you everything. I believe that you are um, able to do that with your groups and with collaboration. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we can kind of delegate some of that authority and some of that power. Um, and another way is there was a couple comments in the chat about whose ideas are being valued. And that's something that I try to be very um, intentional about when I think about, okay, who's going to share an idea in the debrief? Um, who am I calling on? Uh, we know that there's lots of social dynamics happening during the class. We can think about how different students are perceived by others. Like, is that kid smart? Is that kid not smart? And so as teachers, we really have a really big influence over how do the students see each other in the class? Um, and so when I choose to highlight a certain student's contribution, now all of a sudden, all their peers are like, okay, like that student has something very smart to say, like I can learn from them. Um, and by providing the kinds of tasks where there are multiple ways of being smart, it's not just about getting being fast or getting the right answer. There's like all these different ways that we can contribute. Um, and so it just sends these messages to the students that they can contribute and that their voice is being heard and that their voice is being valued as well. Um, and that we can all learn from the ideas that are presented. Okay, so we hope that you all are now wondering where can I get all of these amazing Ethel lessons uh, we have uh, we have spent the last uh, uh, six years um, organizing these and building these and trying these out in class, and uh, we have put them all on the internet. So uh, if you are a high school math teacher and you're teaching Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, or Pre-Calculus, uh, you'll want to go to mathmedic.com. If you are a stats teacher, AP Stats or Intro Stats, you can go to statsmedic.com. And if you're an AP Calc teacher, you can go to calc-medic.com. And what you'll find there is these uh, lessons are available for download to print for free, uh, along with the answer keys. So like you saw Sarah present, the answer keys are presented in two different colors, student work, and then the teacher formal notes are provided in the margins in a different color there. So that's giving you some teacher tips when you look through the answer keys. Uh, in addition to that, every lesson post has uh, tips and tricks that we have learned by trying these lessons in our own classroom. So they'll often give you questions that you could ask your students during the activity or just some logistical things that will make the lesson uh, go well. So uh, our challenge to you all is to uh, go to one of these sites. And I guess the, the specific challenge is to find one or two of these lessons that fits into your curriculum that you're using right now and just give it a try and see what happens. And uh, we hope that it goes well with your students and that you enjoy it and that your students enjoy it. And that, uh, you know, this becomes a, a regular thing that you go all in on this idea of Ethel. Uh, and there are lesson plans for the entire year for all of those courses. So uh, we'd love for teachers to be using those. And uh, we hope that uh, you feel like that's something that you want to, uh, to try out in your own classroom. So. Uh, thank you all for spending some time with us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I thank you guys very much for presenting. Um, I, I think John's question um, is a great one that was, uh, was just posted in the chat. Um, you know, can you talk about how this has shifted the math or um, math slash school culture at your school? Yeah, so I can, can we first give a shout out to John? Yo, what's up, John? John is one of our favorite professors from Grand Valley who we've had as a professor and is amazing. So, John, thanks for joining us. Yes. Um, I, I would say that like this, this shift in like what it means to do mathematics is a shift that has to happen for students, but also for teachers, like myself included. It like took time for me to make that transition. And so, you know, with any staff, it's going to take time to transition into a, you know, a model that might be different than what uh, the teachers are used to. Um, I will say it's kind of neat. We now have students at East Kentwood 
that are uh, that had four full years of Ethel lessons because uh, there are enough teachers that have adopted the Ethel lessons. And so we have students that will be graduating this year after having gone through a full four years of high school curriculum in Ethel. And, uh, you know, I certainly hope that that uh, has created a different math experience for them and, and uh, that they think differently about what mathematics is than if they had gone through, you know, maybe a, a more traditional uh, math uh, sequence. All right, I, I, that's a, thank you for sharing that answer. Um, I, I know a couple of people have, um, have posted questions in the chat about timing. And I know that there were some recommendations that you had put relative to, um, you know, getting it to fit into 50 minutes instead of 60 minutes, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, so my question was 60 minutes, do you have 60 minutes every day or is it like, are you on like a kind of a weird rotating schedule type of thing? We have 58 minute class periods and those meet every day. And then I guess um, there's another question, person somebody's asking about a 90 day block. Cause I know the schools where I'm from, they have like, uh, like four classes one semester for the next. And so they're 90 minute classes. Um, do you have any recommendations related to changing to that sort of thing? Yeah, so we get this question a lot and we've thought about it quite a bit. Um, there are a couple of pieces to the FL format that lend themselves nicely to um, flexibility, I'd say. And the first is the check your understanding problems. So with the check your understanding problems, um, before we get into the 90 minute, I'll point out like if you're on like a 45 minute block or if you don't quite have as much time, uh, sometimes we will use check your understanding as homework problems um, or we might have students start it in class and then maybe we'll project answers but won't have time to go through it all. So that does provide you a lot of flexibility with that part. Um, as far as block schedules go, what we know most teachers have done is whenever possible, they try to fit two Apple lessons into one 90 minute period. But then usually what they'll do is maybe combine the check your understandings for the end of everything um, or sign the check your understandings as homework. Um, for sometimes with that, like you might want to do two lessons in one day and then a third lesson the next day and then maybe practice at the end of that day. So it really just depends on how often you are seeing your students. Um, and some lessons go better together than others. Um, generally, though, we would recommend trying to fit in two lessons when you can. Um, but I wouldn't probably do two lessons every single day because that's just a lot. So, you know, doing two or three in a row and then having like a practice day or sort of like a consolidation day might be helpful. Um, Sarah, do you have any additional thoughts with, you know, like a block schedule versus 60 minutes? Uh, yeah. And how that worked, what you've seen before. Yeah. So the way that our days are set up, um, we actually have, there are not, let's say like 180 F lessons for an 180 day school year. Um, and so there might be closer to maybe 90 F lessons. Um, and then we plan in things for like review days and assessment days. Um, and so I guess my suggestion for if you are on a block schedule, um, you know, there are some days where you can do two F lessons, but you might also maybe you get rid of one of the review days before a quiz and only have a review day before a test. Or because you have that 90 minute block, you could do that last lesson before a quiz and review in the second half of that block and then be ready to take um, an assessment the next day. Maybe the quiz then is, you know, the next day for 30 minutes and then you start the next EFL lesson. Um, and so I think the review days are really where you have a lot of flexibility. Um, you can get rid of them all together. You can shorten them, right? A lot of them are games. So maybe you play it for 20 minutes instead of 35 minutes um, and make some of the adjustments there. Yeah, I'd say um, definitely don't be intimidated just by it saying 180 days of Algebra 1. That does not mean 180 lessons. Um, as Sarah was mentioning, there are way fewer lessons than that. This is just talking, we're trying to get across the point that this is an entire school year's worth, um, but that doesn't mean it has to be 180 days. All right. I, I thank you for answering the questions. Um, uh, of course, um, if people have more questions and they want to reach out to you, um, how could they do that? Yeah, yeah. so um, 
all of, we are all very uh, attached to our emails. So you're welcome to email us at any time. Um, I respond most often um, or monitor that Lindsay at mathmedic.com. So if you have like a mathematic question, try that out. Um, if you are wanting something with stats, it's Luke at statsmedic. And if you're wanting something with calc, it's Sarah at calc-medic.com. Um, we also have Facebook groups that are pretty active with a lot of people there. So if you just search like Mathematic, Calcmedic, Statsmedic, um, there's a lot of collaboration there with teachers who are already using these lessons, who help each other out and share resources. And things like that. So the Facebook groups are also a really great place to get more questions answered. Yep. I was going to say, since you've had the microphone on, I think I heard a lot of typing, but we got everything there. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. all right. Well, well, thank you so much for uh, presenting tonight and uh, get, squeezing this into an hour <laughs> uh, session. Um, I know I really appreciate it. Um, there, there was one, there's one final question here. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I do think they're superhuman. I don't know. I don't know how they're doing all this, but um you know, there was a question about, is there a, a webinar on the assessments? So, um, I mean, maybe we could have you guys back, uh, you know, in the fall um, and sure. uh, talk about the assessments, do a follow-up webinar. If uh, I, I see some nodding. So, so uh, Ron, uh, stay tuned for the future. Um, there will yeah. be something <laughs> in the future. Um, uh, so we definitely appreciate you presenting tonight, um, Lindsay, Luke, and Sarah. Um and I just want to let everybody know our next session is on May 17th. It's going to be Rethinking the Traditional Warm-Up with Juan Gomez. So I appreciate everybody joining us tonight. And I look forward to seeing many of you in about two weeks. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.